Um, the thing I've really been struck by is how everybody here is a hybrid in many ways. Um, you know, some bridging two worlds, some bridging several worlds. So I just, I thought, okay, it got me thinking about my own crazy path. And I just want to quickly, you know, I started off really uh, one of these people who never had much exposure to nature as a child. And then at first year of university, by a totally weird uh, lining up of the stars, I got a job at the end of my first year as a park naturalist. And nobody was more surprised than me when I got this job because <laughs> I knew nothing about natural history. But I'd been just advised on kind of a few things I should do to, to prepare for the interview. But there was something that you know, I remember I was, I was, I had sort of flubbed this interview. And there were two interviewers. It was like the angel and the devil. And the devil kept pointing out, you know, kind of all my failures. But I had an angel there. And he was, he was kind of staring at me intently. And I said, you know, and it's funny, I think, I think as I was walking in here, you said to me, speak the truth. Did you say that? Or did I imagine that you said that? John. Whoa. <laughs> I, thought you, I thought I heard you say that. Because I remember that at, that, at that critical moment when, you know, my, my whole, as it turned out, I think future was in the balance. I said, you know, I really don't know anything about natural history. But I promise that if you give me this chance, I will learn. And much to my utter astonishment, I was given that chance. Um, and then I had the profound experience of going to this park on the, on the coast of, Van of Vancouver Island and um, falling in love, spending every night at this estuary and observing the merganser and her chicks and the belted kingfishers who come home to its, its, its hole and just watching this whole dynamic. And then each summer thereafter, I, I chose a different environment. And I went and I just tried to absorb as much as I could. And then my first real job was as a biologist in Banff National Park, which is eerily reminiscent of Aspen. And I've just been brought back to that. And I, my job there became teaching other naturalists how to translate. And then I, I constantly had this, you know, like every, everybody here does, this feeling that somehow we needed to bring more people into the tent. And the people in national parks were already there to some extent. So I moved to Vancouver and became the director of education at the, at the Vancouver Aquarium, which is in the heart of the city, and started really focusing on education. That, because I knew people love animals. And that if you could work with that inherent love that people have of animals, then you could show them that in order, if they care about these animals, they have to care about their connections to the environment and how we are engaging, how we're affecting that for better or worse. So that was my magnificent obsession for uh, a number of years. Then increasingly, I started working as a journalist. I had a newspaper column in the Vancouver Sun. I started writing uh, feature stories. And the thing that I loved the most was telling tales of passionate scientists. Because I, I just you know saw scientists as such a wonderful way in to tell a complex story. And then by another weird series of circumstances, I was asked to attend. It was the second round of this program called the Aldo Leopold Leadership Program, which was started by an amazing woman who's a friend and colleague of Kathleen's, Jane Lubchenco, and who Sharon Dunwoody also has been very involved with working with. And I was asked to come as the journalist to talk to this group of 20 environmental scientists who had taken a big risk. They wanted to start working on coming out of the ivory tower and trying to engage with the world. And I showed up there. And 
what happened was it became like this huge venting session where every scientist had a story to tell me about how they'd been done wrong. <laughs> and I sat there, you know, and, and I had incredible empathy because, you know, there were some real horror stories. But I also realized, well, my one little voice wasn't enough. And so that actually embarked me on what I'm doing now, which is really trying to build a broad network of journalists who will come with me to various workshops, Aldo Leopold. Um, you know, there is a huge appetite for this, I'm finding, amongst scientists. In the last you know, year, I've been, I, I can't tell you how many, I've worked with um, Yellowstone to Yukon, brought in a, a bunch of scientists, um, government, academic, and NGO. Um, we're going to do one actually, um, somebody mentioned about, you know, the Brits are scared. Well, the British Council has asked us to put together a workshop for young up and coming climate change scientists. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Michelle is going to be one of the journalists who comes and um, works with us and those young scientists. And we have people from um, NPR, The Economist. But you know, the thing is, that I have had the most amazing experience of reaching out to journalists and you know, really studiously looking at who are the brightest and the best, who are doing work that really matters. And if you were to ask them to come to a conference to cover it, they would never do it in a million years. But if you say to them, would you come and help me give these poor scientists a window into your world and to describe your ecosystem and where you fit in it and who are your predators and prey, they go, man, do they need it. I'm there. And it's, you know, I, there are people from just a, I, this huge uh, growing body of journalists who are committed to this. Now, I in no way am implying that, you know, I'm doing this alone. A lot of other people are doing this, and Tony is doing a huge parallel effort. And it's interesting because we've been talking, and what we do is slightly different. Our focus is much more, I would say, it's almost like therapy. Wouldn't you say, yeah. Michelle? You know, it's <laughs> like on both sides. The journalist saying, you know, I, you know, you guys just don't get it. And the scientist saying, well, you don't understand our constraints. Yeah. So anyways, I want to just start off, I want to show you this little video clip that um, I put together as an icebreaker for our workshops. Because one of the first things we do when we start these is I ask the scientists, OK, what are your greatest fears about working with journalists? And what are your greatest hopes? And I have I t a group of the Aldo Leopold scientists were kind enough to let me take some very candid clips of their own experiences and true confessions. We might have to turn up the volume. You know, the little crises that people face uh, have to do with, I think, the simplest things in life. Uh, for instance, this telephone here, right? So I um, get a lot of calls from the press. Um, and I have to admit, one of the reasons I'm here is I actually don't return this. <laughs> 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 I pitched the story to another journalist, and they got the science report that they find all the quotes on the wall of the paper film. And, and then we didn't, didn't spend any time the evening before thinking about what my message was. So I got front page above the whole story with exactly the wrong headline and exactly the wrong conclusion. We got interviewed in the front lawn of the White House. I thought this was my 15 minutes of fame that I deserved, and there they were. And I got a call from somebody from Discover Magazine who was really interested in the story. And um, I did a fantastic job in about 10 minutes on the phone of taking him to be really interested to my dark new board. <laughs> Thanks very much. I never heard from you. Really, I need some training. 
the message was totally missed because I didn't bother to spend the time that evening to think about it. And I even got the $100 question at the end of the interview before he said to me, so what do you want the headline? But in the the uh, the sound clip said, "I'm going to Brazil to buy computers," <laughs> and everybody kept asking me why that was. <laughs> so that was my introduction to the press. So it is really important to think about the message. That's one of the main reasons for being here is to actually train myself what not to say because I tend to, once you ask me a question, I'm like, I'm going to tell you everything. <laughs> oh, here it is. <laughs> this is the magic diagram of the day of the day. <laughs> all over, make it really simple with easy, easy little words and just a few points. Well, I think, I, I think everybody needs to understand that for Potamo chemists, it is incumbent that we have a parsimonious paradigm shift from measuring metals in unity to actually examining speciation in order to really gauge the relative contributions of anthropogenic and ambient metals. <laughs> and so in order to gauge that, we really need to examine the presence of not just copper, but copper sulfate, copper phosphate, divalent, trivalent, we don't need to get the country. And we really understand. <laughs> <laughs> and we you call that a message? <laughs> Second reason is really because I have this a sense that I often sit down with people with people that are decision makers, policy makers, and analysts, and we just talk right past one another. And I should try to make policy based on what I said. It's a shock that anything that I would say, anybody would want to do anything with it. I worked in private industry for several years. In fact, I worked for a power company in their environmental department, which was a very good experience to have because it gives you a different perspective on uh, 
interactions between science and the government, how to get better traction between science and policy. The one thing I'm going to do, which I would never have thought about doing before, is contacting my local congressman's office. I am going to call my congressman and senator. It's something I've never done. I've never even written them. Because I never thought it would make any bit of difference at all. This is just one guy. And I guess maybe I was wrong. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to be teaching a grad seminar this spring and using a lot of what we've been doing here and bringing that to our graduate students because I think it's particularly valuable to them so to learn how to do it early in their career and how to reach out. <laughs> Twenty, thirty, however many years we have, we can build kind of a support network too for scientists who want to want to have a bigger impact. So you'll be hearing from us. <laughs> Well, thanks. Whoops. Um, and I, I'm very grateful to all those scientists. And you know, the other thing I was thinking about, we haven't talked a whole lot about, but is a big theme here too, is risk. And I think everybody in this room is, are risk takers. And I, and I think that part of this cultural change that we're talking about is encouraging risk taking. And you know, I, I really have to say that I am feeling, I don't know what's doing this, optimistic because I do, from where I sit, see a change occurring in the scientific community. I see more and more scientists who really want to make a difference and are hungry to know how, just like the public is hungry to know how, what they can do to make a difference. So I just want to spend a few minutes, I'll try, I'm going to go fast, um, but I want to deconstruct why there are these tensions between the worlds of science and journalism. Sometimes I call this, you know, uh, journalists are from Venus, scientists are from Mars. But in fact, what I have found is that actually scientists and journalists are almost like two sides of the same coin. There's a lot of common qualities. There is that incredible drive uh, to discover new things. There's a skepticism. Uh, there's a passion for what you're doing, a competitiveness, independent thinkers, and there's also this propensity like to drink and talk, like, which is what makes these get-togethers a lot of fun. So there's a lot in common in that quest for knowledge, but there is a big difference. In fact, it's upside down. The whole scientific method is all about building your case and at the very, very end, reaching your conclusions. And if you see a journalist in a poster session, they're walking along like this, reading the very bottom line of every poster. And then, and probably a lot of you have learned to do that too, and then if, if it catches their attention, they will jump up to the top and then scoot down. So. The trick for scientists is to learn to turn the way you've been taught to talk about your science on its head and to start with your conclusion and think very carefully about what is your bottom line and what do you want to say about it and to answer the question, so what? Okay, so what are some of the differences? What, what, what? We said, okay, scientists, first of all, you want to present your evidence because, of course, the conclusion's validity is based on that. And journalists just want you to, you know, cut to the chase. Journalists want the quick overview. They don't, they don't have time. Scientists um, are very comfortable dealing with uncertainty. In fact, Sharon has written a whole book on this topic, Communicating Uncertainty. Journalists are always pushing you to say, how certain can you be? And then give the caveats if you must. But this is where we've gotten in such a mess with climate change, is focusing on the uncertainty rather than on what you can agree on. The journalist is always trying to bring more people into their tent. They've got an audience, and so they want to take the specifics that you're talking about, and they're always pushing you to generalize, which is a very uncomfortable situation for scientists to be in. And of course, where you went to school, 
who you studied with, where you publish is all important in the academic community. But for journalists, perspectives matter. And they're looking for different ones. And that can be maddening when you find an expert juxtaposed with somebody who you know doesn't have. The, there's no equality in actually the uh, value of the perspective being offered. But one of the things that, that scientists can do is to help the journalists know who else they should be talking to. Because how are they to know? How are they to know who are the experts and who's not? And to also warn them of the sort of naysayers and what they're going to say. Now, this is a huge one. And you know, this is what's, what I've loved about this workshop is that it's a lot about heart. It's not just about head. But scientists are just, you know, typically, as you all know, all about head and are very, very uncomfortable moving into this whole realm. Well, how do you feel about this? And of course, you know, the time frame that journalists that work under is just almost inconceivable. And that's one of the first things, if you are dealing with a journalist, to ask them, what is your, your deadline? And, you know, some people, um, if you're a reporter working for AP, you might have to write five stories in a day. Um, if you're somebody like Michelle, I'm sure that you have an incredible range of deadlines, depending on who you're writing for. What would be the range? <laughs> yeah. So you need to know that. And for, you know, many journalists do not have the luxury to become experts. This says, today I'm an expert in politics, economy, car repair, aerospace, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, liposuction. And this, who typically is the most important little voice on your shoulder as a scientist? or for scientists, for those of you who are scientists. Who's the, pardon? Your peers. Your, yeah, absolutely. And it's the scientific, oh. what are my peers going to think? And, you're, and, and the, the mistake that many scientists make is that they're talking to their peers when they're answering a journalist instead of thinking about who the audience is that this journalist represents. Now, who is the voice in the ear of a journalist? <laughs> and it's often not just one editor. It can be many. So there, there can be a whole kind of, you know, pyramid. So this is what creates this incredible tension as a journalist is trying to get what they want out of the often recalcitrant scientist who is only willing to give what they're willing to give. And this is one of the big things we spend a lot of time talking about in um, Aldo Leopold is is it okay for a scientist to be a citizen? Is it okay for a scientist to talk about their feelings and their beliefs? And one of the most eloquent scientists I know, his name is Daniel Pauly, and he ironic and he he's a he's the most um, cited fishery scientist alive, and he's also just an amazing. Uh, philosopher, really, and thinker. And ironically, he won this huge prize called the Cosmos Prize um, from the Japanese, uh, which is, you know, I mean, he, they have been bedeviled by many of his studies. But at his acceptance speech, one of the things he talked about, which I thought is, you know, so true, is he used this metaphor, is that, you know, those who would silence scientists focus on the notion that an engagement of the environment would compromise our scientific objectivity. But this argument is never invoked in medicine. Passionate engagement for the patients against disease-causing agents is not the norm, but an essential element of doctors' professional ethics. Why doesn't that translate to ecological scientists whose patient is the earth? And why is there this division? I just think that it's, if, if we could get this one thought across to scientists, I think it would be just huge. So what do you, what, what do you think are some of the, there, you know, it's amazing. I've done all these polls and the same things come up time and time again about what scientists think about journalists. Off the top of your head, quickly. They drink a lot. 
<laughs> well, they both do. Yeah. Uh huh. What else? Uh huh. Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. They take the fifth. <laughs> okay. So I just talk about the media. There is as an elaborate a taxonomy of journalists as there are of scientists. And I always try to demonstrate that in these workshops. We bring in people from NPR, The Economist, New York Times, and you know, uh, often a local reporter to show that uh, each individual is very, very different, and that's just absolutely critical to understand who you're talking to. Okay. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on this, but we actually do spend a lot of time deconstructing this and getting the journalists to provide insight on kind of the reality of some of these things. So what do you think journalists think about scientists? <laughs> okay, so there are barriers to overcome. Scientists who can't explain their work, journalists who fear science. This is a big one. Editors who underestimate public interest. Tony and I were talking about this. You know, Tony's working with a lot of the brightest and the best, and they're convinced. But the challenge is convincing their editors that, that their story is worthy of a piece of the very limited media real estate. And there's a fight for every inch of turf every day. Corey Dean, uh, the, who was science editor at the New York Times and now is mostly writing, tells a story about how you know, journalists face, they have to sell their stories within the paper. And every day at four o'clock, there's a meeting where um, people go and talk about what's going to be on page one. And Corey says often she'll send one of her reporters with uh, the story that they think should be there, that the team has agreed ought to be. And the reporters often will come back and say they didn't get it. And Corey says, no, it means we didn't give it. And that is really the basis of where much of the problem lies between scientists and journalists, is often the scientists aren't giving it. And this is a huge one. And we have this idea that if only, if only we could just convey the right information, that everybody would see things the way we do and change would occur. But it's not about information. We've talked about this. It's about values. It's about what we care about. And so the prism you have to think about when you're talking about this is who are you talking to and what do they care about? And what do their constituents care about? And how do you, you don't change what it is you're saying, you just, your messages or the points you want to make are the same, but you have to translate them in, the, in a way that's relevant to whoever it is you're talking to. You know, I was thinking today, I am so, I was so moved by Kathleen's stories. And I was thinking, you know, one of the differences, journalists um, have a taxonomy. There's news and there's features. And you have to think about what it is you're doing, whether it fits into those. But I was thinking that one of the reasons that um, writers like David, like Kathleen are so powerful, is you also have the time and space to really tell a story, which is much more compressed and hard to do in the hurly-burly world of everyday news. So, you know, and it does take, you know, a feature story is a great luxury. This is actually um, a story I wrote that it was one of the most amazing things I'd ever learned was the fact that this scientist, um, who was a, a truly heroic figure, um, had spent many nights studying the forest and learned that, in fact, bears at night during the salmon runs play an incredible role hauling enormous amounts of salmon from the rivers 
far into the forest, kilometers in, depending, the bigger the fish, the farther they go, so they don't have to fight for their food. Turns out wolves do this too. But he also found that you could trace this by looking for N15, which uh, is marine based and not found in the terrestrial environment. So by doing these cores, he could see what the influence was. And it turns out that everything in these Pacific Northwest systems are actually reliant on salmon fertilizing the forest, right down to the fish that fertilize the flies that feed the migrating warblers that come next spring. And, you know, I told the story about how the struggles he'd been through, how he was trying to put, this is the Great Bear Rainforest, which actually finally has received some protection. He hated my story because it was way too much about him. And, you know, he sort of, and I, I actually, you know, he sort of, he said, well, you know, you got the facts right, but I really think you went about this the wrong way. But he got so much positive feedback that eventually he came back to me and said, well, maybe it was all right. <laughs> okay, so what makes a good story? There are many ways in. And this is, I, I, you know, I was looking at Kathleen's different ways in and how she weaves them together. And, you know, this is always, this is always what you're, as a, you know, a writer or a storyteller, you're, what you're thinking about. And that is what, you know, all journalists are storytellers. And... Scientists are not trained to think like storytellers. And I don't think that every scientist should be expected to become a storyteller. But I think it helps to be aware of what are the different ways that stories can be told. And this is a tough one for many scientists to observe that, you know, it's not necessarily the whole story. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to just, what we talked about this, scientists are trusted by the public. Uh, the press is way down at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> these tests are eye openers. And this is not to mean that everybody is ignorant. But they, you know, it is, it is a baseline across society. And it's pretty amazing. This is my favorite. <laughs> OK, so. I, you know, I, I, when this came out, I thought, wow, we are starting to tip. If Time Magazine can say, be worried, be very worried, and to come up with that bold statement. We're not there yet, as we know, but there is, there is movement. However, the polling shows that the public is still confused. And, and I'm not going to go into this because we've talked about this a little bit, but that but the public does think that scientists have a lot of disagreement, much more so than they actually do. Scientists confirmed today everything we know about the structure of the universe is wrong, wrong, wrong. wrong. The, the public is confused, you know, and I think it's really important that, um, I think, and journalists all agree with this, is trying to, how do you clarify? So, you know, at the end of the day, though, it is worth the struggle because the reality is that policymakers are paying attention and they use mainstream media as an indicator of what their constituents think. And they especially care about editorials because, uh, you know, a news feature may be one thing, but an editorial really means that um, there's kind of wholesale feeling about this. And, I was, um, there have been, I work a lot in the marine world, and there have been some, just in the last few weeks, uh, some incredible movement after years and years of efforts. Uh, Robert mentioned the Altered Ocean series, and um, this, this is a series that ran about, um, I guess, a week and a half, two weeks ago in the LA Times for five days 
front page every day. But the thing about it was that it wasn't just a front page story. It was a huge multimedia effort. So everybody from far and wide could check in on this. And what was really interesting, and I sort of have an insider perspective on this, and I'll come clean because Ken Weiss is actually my partner. And he's going to be actually showing up tonight to join me. And um, I, I know he's going to really look forward to talking to some of you. But you know, when he proposed this to the paper, they said, ah, who wants to hear a bunch of depressing stories? You know, we've all heard it before, you know. And the, his stories are, but they're, they are, as we talked about, they're stories of grief, they're stories of loss, they're stories of remembering. Remembering what we had. Remembering how things were at one time. And, you know, the world, uh, Jeremy Jackson, who is a brilliant scientist, a uh, marine scientist, said, you know, everybody thinks the world began when they did, which is why old people are so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Daniel Pauly calls this shifting baseline, that we kind of get used to how these changes occur. But the thing that has been so unbelievable has been, and I encourage you to check this out, it's latimes.com slash oceans. The public response to this series and the message board and everybody weighing in and talking and you know, expressing their feelings about it, there was sadness. But there was also, uh, I would say, determination that things have to change. Moral outrage that this just isn't right. What are we going to do about it? You know, we've, what have, we've got to do something about it. And so now there's been this huge outcry for more coverage on solutions. What's working where? And there's going to be the continuation of all this. Now, people have been working on ocean issues for a really, really long time, in particular, trying to protect areas of the oceans in marine protected areas. Less than 1% of the oceans is fully protected. And just yesterday, there was really um, a historic step taken where the central coast of California finally, in this vote, this process that's been going on for a really, really long time, that is the culmination of seven years of scientists and NGOs and all sorts of people working on this issue, voted to establish 29 marine protected areas and to protect 18% of the central coast of California and 9% fully protected from absolutely no extraction. And the rest of it not allowed for commercial extraction. And I, I think that um, it, it's been astounding because I've, you know, people like Jane Lubchenco, um, worked at all sorts of putting together consensus statements, uh, putting together the science, but there was the problem was the resistance was from a very small and vocal group, which were the fishermen. And what really needed to happen, and the fight was to try to convince the fishermen, and we could, but why can't you be convinced because you'll be the beneficiaries of this? But in fact, what had to happen was that the debate had to be widened to bring in the rest of, the, of all these other communities to say, hey, you know, we have a stake in this too. And I, I really think that the scientific community is realizing that you know, um, we made a lot of mistakes along the way and that it is about bringing in the public to these debates and saying, hey, this is not just about the direct users. So I think, you know, I think that this is really exciting to see what's happening now. There's some movement. It wasn't as much, you know, the scientists wanted 13% uh, fully protected. The fishermen wanted 3% fully protected. But the other thing that has shifted is that, is that the fishermen now are, are saying, OK, you know, because it was this catch-22. They said it won't work. And, you know, but how do you know if it's going to work if you don't have any? And so now they say, well, let's just wait and see what happens. Will this actually create uh, recovery? And to what degree? So I, I think this is happy and, you know, yesterday so many of the people I know were just rejoicing, saying, wow, you know, it's a small step, but it's a significant one. And I think that's what we do have to concentrate on are the small but significant steps. 
I just want to summarize by saying, you know, I think that for scientists as communicators, there's all of these elements that I've heard you talking about. Um, and no one person has to be all of these things. But I do think that what I feel really good about and really excited about and really hopeful about is that I think that the scientific community, because they care, because they are the witnesses to nature, are really starting to let their voices be heard.